Now, my name is Pastor Hal York. I'd like to welcome you to our online service. This is March the 28th. We're glad you've been able to join us. This is Palm Sunday, and uh, we trust you've been able to, to view those announcements. I won't be going over them again, but uh, just the regular services and Bible studies this coming week. But also Friday is Good Friday, as you know. This coming weekend is Easter, and we will be not having a, a Good Friday service in the church, but we will, we will be posting a, an online service or an online message for Good Friday. And so you want to keep that in mind. The links will be on our webpage and on Facebook, and it'll be shown on YouTube. And so just keep that in mind. But we're glad you've joined us and trust you'll be blessed as you worship together with us. In Psalm 93, verse 1, it says, The Lord reigns. He is clothed with majesty. The Lord has clothed and girded himself with strength. Indeed, the world is firmly established. It will not be moved. Your throne is established from of old. You are from everlasting. Matthew 21, 1 through 17. When they had approached Jerusalem and had come to Bethpage at the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village opposite you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied there, and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord has need of them, and immediately he will send them. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, gentle and mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the foal of a beast, a burden. The disciples went and did just as Jesus had instructed them, and brought the donkey and the colt and laid their coats on them, and he sat on the coats. Most of the crowd spread their coats on the road, and others were cutting branches from the trees and spreading them on the road. The crowds were ahead of him, and those who followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the Son of David! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! Hosanna in the highest! And when he had entered Jerusalem, all the city was stirring, saying, Who is this? And the crowds were saying, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. And Jesus entered the temple and drove out all those who were buying and selling in the temple and overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who were selling doves. And he said to them, It is written, My house shall be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a robber's den. And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. But when the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things that he had done and the children who were shouting in the temple, Hosanna to the Son of David, they became indignant and said to him, Do you hear what these children are saying? 
And Jesus said to them, Yes, have you never bred out of the mouth of, out of, the mouth of infants and nursing babes you have prepared praise for yourself? And he left them and went out of the city to Bethany and spent the night there. May God bless the reading of his word. you've been able to worship the Lord with those couple of songs, crown him with many crowns, that wonderful old hymn. And uh, let's just look to the Lord in prayer as we look into God's word this morning. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for its truth. We thank you that it is a word that is all sufficient, that is all powerful. We thank you for who you are, the author and the finisher of our faith. You are the great king the king who reigns above all other kings. You are the one who has created everything that is, and without without you, nothing will be created that has been created. And so, Father, we serve you, and we thank you, Lord, for for your great love that you've shown to us in your Son, Jesus Christ, as we anticipate this Good Friday, Easter weekend. We just are reminded, Lord, of what it's all about, truly all about. And we pray we'll be reminded of that once again this morning as we look into your word. That what a glorious and wonderful salvation, a powerful, life-transforming salvation, being brought from death unto life. You've been prepared a place for us in heaven, and we now can call you our Father. You've adopted us into your family because of the the sacrifice that Jesus Christ made on the cross 2,000 years ago for sinners. And so we thank you, Lord, for this time together as your church that we can worship you, we can lift up your glorious name, remember who, remembering who you are. And we, we know there are many, Lord, who would love to be with us this morning and in person, but because of uh, COVID and health issues, and, and we know that they, they're unable to be here. So we pray for a special blessing upon them, those struggling with health issues as well. And, and we just thank you, Lord, for as you are the great physician, and we pray your hand might be upon them. We think especially of Karen Scrivens and and, and Blair, and we just pray that you might just be very near to them and, and have your hand upon Karen and, and uh, her health, and we just pray that you just uh, touch her, give the doctors wisdom, and we pray, Lord, that she might be able to, to feel strength and be, begin to regain strength and the issues that she's dealing with, that you might just heal them. 
Um, we just uh, know, F Father, that you love them and care for them and pray your hand might be upon them. You might sense your peace and your power in a very wonderful way. Think of Lee also in the hospital, Lee Wolf, and we just pray your continued hand upon him. As thank you for the answer of prayer that he is getting a bit of relief from his back pain, but we just pray your hand will be continue to be upon him and for the doctors as well. But Lord, we thank you for this time together, and we pray, Lord, as we look into your word, this very familiar story, that you would open our hearts and our minds, that you would fill us with your spirit, and that your spirit would teach us, and and lift up that, that wonderful name, that name which is above every name, the name of Jesus Christ. And so bless us as we open your word together, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if you have a Bible with you, we're going to be looking at that passage of Scripture that was read earlier in Matthew chapter 21. This is Palm Sunday when we celebrate what's re traditionally been referred to as the triumphal entry. And uh, we're going to be looking at that, then we'll be picking up more of the Easter story on Good Friday and then again on Easter Sunday. It's a story, one of the few stories that's recorded in all four Gospels, the story of the triumphal entry. But it doesn't take up a lot of space in any of the Gospels. The bulk of the Gospel narrative tells us about the, the events that transpire after his triumphal entry, that last week leading up to his crucifixion and resurrection. The last five or six days of Jesus' life, especially in John's gospel, take up a, a majority of that gospel narrative. But as we know, Jesus is riding into Jerusalem, as we'll see in a moment, and he's, this last week of his life, it's the last week of his three years of public ministry. And in these th last three years, he, for the most part, has avoided any attempt to make him king, He's not been promoting himself openly as the Messiah. Jesus repeatedly suppressed the excitement that people had for him and desiring to make him king, as we know. But that was all about to change. Jesus and his disciples have stopped in Bethpage leading up to this event. They visited Mary and Martha and Lazarus the night before the events that are about to transpire. As we know, Lazarus was still attracting people to, who wanted to see him. He'd, Jesus had risen him from the dead. And Lazarus was still attracting a great deal of attention from the people. So much so that John's Gospel tells us that the Pharisees were looking for a way to, to find to kill him. But this was Passover week. And during Passover, as you know, there's a, a, quite an exodus or quite a, a gathering uh, to Jerusalem of the Jewish people. And no doubt as that day is getting closer, the crowds are getting larger and lar larger than normal. They were mingling around and making their way into Jerusalem from all over Israel. And Jesus, being in Bethany, leaves that town and with his disciples and heads for Jerusalem. And that's when the events begin to unfold that we read earlier in Matthew chapter 21. So the setting, as we've stated, was the beginning of Passover week. Some writers have estimated that the crowds that would have been beginning to gather or may have been present during this event would have been anywhere from one to two million. What does a crowd of one to two million people look like? Well, it's kind of hard for us to wrap our minds around those kind of numbers, but I, was, I looked up, just for curiosity's sake, just because many of us saw the Raptors celebrating the NBA title a few years ago in, in Toronto and the big parade that they had. And, and what, the Raptors crowd was estimated to be around one million people that lined the parade route to, to celebrate their championship. So that, if you picture that in your mind, that's kind of what a, million, a crowd of a million people looks like. But if you were a Roman Pilate or Herod, or if you are a Roman ruler in Jerusalem, this was a very nervous time for you. They were aware of the hatred that the Jews had for the fact that the Roman was, the, the Gentile, the Roman nation was ruling over them. They had a headquarters in Jerusalem. They paid taxes to Rome, and they did not like that. And they knew as the crowds got larger and larger through the week, the possibility of an uprising was always there. So they had to step very carefully 
during this week, and we see that play out in how they handled Jesus and the trials and so on. They were very, very careful not to rock the boat. Well, Jesus is very much aware of what's going on. He's very much aware that, aware that this, last, this was the last week of his life on earth. He's very much aware of the events that were going to be planned out and walked through in these next six or seven days were planned before the foundation of the world. Events that would culminate in the cross. And so from Jesus' perspective, it's time to, t- to reveal himself for who he was. No more secrecy. It's time to rock the boat. It's time to rock the boat. Jesus knows what awaits him in a few days. He knows this is why he came. Jesus knows what the Pharisees and the religious rulers really think about him. And now it's time to force their hand. He had the courage to not only enter Jerusalem, but to enter in a public way, a very public way, about as public as you could possibly make it. And this contrasts to his previous pattern of suppressing the public accolades that people wanted to display upon Jesus. One writer has said that the applause and the crowds were not manipulated. They would have occurred in any case, but the ride on a colt, because it was planned, could only be an act of parable, a deliberate act of self-disclosure. The secrecy was being lifted. No more secret hatred. They will be forced to show their true colors. And that's what we need to see under, understandable what's going on here. The, this triumphal entry had a purpose. It, it showed that Jesus was fulfilling the prophecy of Zechariah 9.9, which you'll see in verse 5. Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, gentle and mounted on a donkey. Jesus was very much aware of that prophecy, and he was going to fulfill it, as we'll see in a moment. But Jesus reminds us that he was very much in control of the events that affected his life. He sets in motion events that would eventually culminate in his death upon the cross, and he knows that. He knows he's forcing the people, he's forcing the religious rulers to show their true colors, to show their real heart. There will be no more secret hatred of Jesus. It was all going to be laid on the table, beginning with this triumphant entrance into Jerusalem. Jesus was not caught up in the emotion and enthusiasm of the moment and decided that this would make a good time to make an entrance No, Jesus is calling the shots. It's not the crowd, it's not the disciples, or it's not some emotional reaction. He sends the two two disciples to get a colt. He doesn't just send his disciples to find something for him to ride into Jerusalem on, and they come back with a cart, or they come back with a chariot, or they come back with a donkey instead of a stallion. No, God predicted this is how he would enter Jerusalem, and Jesus told him to go find exactly what Zechariah told him he would be riding in on. He didn't ask for a donkey to relieve the fatigue of his traveling, for he could very easily have walked the rest of the way. But kings are known to ascend their chariots, from which they may be easily seen. And so the Lord intended to turn the eyes of the people on himself and place some mark of approval on the applauses of his followers, lest any might think that he was unwillingly received the honor of a king. He did this so that scripture might be fulfilled. Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. Jesus fulfills this prophecy. This was Jesus' plan. He was not at this time intended to come into the earthly splendor and spectacle or to reign in earthly power. He did not come in wealth but in poverty. He did not come in royal robes but in meekness. But most importantly, now this is what we need to think about. He did not come to rescue Rome from Israel from Rome's oppression. 
but he came rather to seek and to save the lost. He came to give his life as a ransom for many. The details and the timing of this story, his incarnation were not the product of man's choosing, but of God's. Jesus is very much in control of the timing and of the events that are about to unfold. There were over a hundred, some people say over 300 prophecies concerning the coming Messiah in the Old Testament and things pertaining to who he was, where he will be born, and what he would do in his activities. And Jesus Christ fulfilled every one of them. He was the Messiah. And so Jesus sends his disciples to go and get the colt and his mother, and it, went, and it went exactly like Jesus said it would. None of the disciples, including the two he sent for them, understood the Lord's purpose for this at this time. John tells us that in chapter 12, verse 16. These things his disciples did not understand at the first, but when Jesus was glorified, when they remembered that these things were written of him, and they had done these things to him. And they returned with the colt. It had no saddle. The colt and his mother, the donkey. The disciples put their coats on it for Jesus to sit on. And as the crowds are making their way to Jerusalem, the crowds are building. And they, don't, they no doubt understand the significance of Jesus riding on the colt. And they begin to lay coats down and wave palm branches. This had become a symbolic way or a symbol of the hope of the Messiah's coming who taught with such authority and healed the sick and raised the dead. The people followed him from Bethpage when he left. Others heard he was coming from Jerusalem and came out to meet him. And the crowd just kept growing and growing and growing in number. The crowd was excited. And this excitement continued to grow as the crowd grew and they got closer and closer to Jerusalem. Now, not everyone would have called themselves followers of Jesus. Some maybe not even knew who he was. But rumors, people were telling everybody, this is who he is, this is what he's done, that he raised, he's the one who raised Lazarus from the dead, and they no doubt were talking about his miracles and so on. But if you've ever been in a crowd like this, even if you're not a Raptors fan and you were at that parade after they won the championship, it would, it would be very easy for you to get caught up and all the hoopla and all the celebration and the fanfare going along with the celebration. And I'm sure that was no doubt the case here. Well, what were they saying? The crowds going ahead of him and those who followed were shouting. They weren't just murmuring. They were shouting this from the top of their lungs. Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna comes from a Hebrew word that means give salvation now. Psalm 118, 26 says, Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you from the house of the Lord. The term son of David makes it clear that they were acknowledging that Christ was the Messiah, acknowledging his messianic claim that the Messiah would be, in fact, the son of David and establish his throne forever. And Jesus never told them to stop saying these things. He never shrunk from their worship. He never shrunk from their adoration. Why? Because he was the Messiah. He was the son of David. He was Emmanuel, God with us. He was the promised one who would crush Satan's head. He was the one who would establish the kingdom his kingdom. He was the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and he still is. So Jesus does not tell them to tone it down. But there were some who did. In Luke chapter 19, verse 39, some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. But Jesus answered, I tell you, if these become silent, the stones themselves will cry out. The expectations that the Messiah would bring deliverance were so great that the crowd became totally caught up in what, from a human perspective, was like mob hysteria. Yet completely in accord with God's plan, they were unknowingly fulfilling prophecy. And this celebration was so loud that when they entered the city, some were asking, who is this? Who is this? 
And the Pharisees, no doubt concerned for what they were seeing, said it seems like the whole world has gone after him. And no doubt the disciples were quite excited about the whole event as well. Because if we go back to chapter 20, verse 17 to 19, it says, verse 17, As Jesus was about to go up to Jerusalem, he took the twelve disciples aside by themselves, and on the way he said to them, Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem. There's going to be this big parade. They're going to log me as Messiah. No. He said, Behold, we are going to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered up to the chief priests and scribes, and they will condemn him to death. And they will hand him over to the Gentiles to mock and to scourge and to crucify him. On the third day, he will be raised up. What we see transpiring in the triumphal entry was not the picture Jesus painting, painted concerning what it would be like on this trip to Jerusalem. Jesus very much understood what was about to transpire. He was not caught up, if you will, in the emotion of the moment. Jesus had set forth a scenario that seems pretty far-fetched compared to what's going on in chapter 21. And maybe the disciples were thinking, well, maybe this changes everything. Maybe Jesus was just preparing them just in case things went sideways when he got to Jerusalem. But they get to Jerusalem, and this happens. Man, this is great. This is what we've been waiting for. Jesus is finally going to set up his kingdom. He's finally going to declare himself the Messiah and establish his kingdom and put down Rome. And we're going to be able to rule and reign with him. So maybe Jesus was wrong. If I had been one of the disciples, that's what I would have been hoping at least. But Luke 19.41 tells us something interesting about what Jesus was doing on this ride in. Amidst all the hoopla and all the excitement and all the accolades, he knew what was about to transpire. He knew where this was leading. And Luke 19.41 says, When he approached Jerusalem, he saw the city and he wept over it saying, If you had known in this day even you the things which make for peace, but now they have been hidden from your eyes. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will throw up a barricade against you and surround you and hem you in on every side, and that's exactly what happened. They surrounded Jerusalem and destroyed it. Rome did. They will level you to the ground, your new children within you, and they will not leave you one stone upon another, because you did not recognize the time of your visitation. Now, if I was to put a title on this message, it's kind of weird to tell you the title in the middle of the message, but this is where I want, to, want us to go this morning and Friday and again on Easter. The title would be simply this, Behold, your king. If you go back to Matthew 21, verse 5, say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, gentle and mounted on a donkey. The crowds went before him and followed him, were shouting, Hosanna to the king, blessed is you who comes in the name of the Lord. They were basically saying, in all their excitement and all their anticipation, this religious hysteria, our problems are over. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The blessed is he who comes to will save us now. And they were saying, Behold our King. Behold our King. Yeah, we will hear that phrase again in a few days but with a different response and spoken by a different person. Behold our King. Listen as I read John 19, these very sobering words. It happened only five days later, four or five days later, in this event on here, here. After all the hoopla, all the excitement, all the accolades, 
In John 19, we read this. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and by that law he ought to be, die, because he made himself out to be the Son of God. Therefore Pilate heard this statement. He was even more afraid. And he entered into the praetorium again and said to Jesus, Who, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. So Pilate said to him, do you, you do not speak to me? Do you not know that I have authority to release you and I have authority to crucify you? And Jesus answered, You would have no authority over me unless it had been given you from above. For this reason he who delivered me to you as the greater sin. As a result of this, Pilate made efforts to release him. But the Jews cried out, saying, If you release this man, you are no friend of Caesar. Everyone who makes himself out to be a king opposes Caesar. Therefore, when Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and sat down in the judgment seat at a place called the pavement, but in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation of the Passover. It was about the sixth hour. Now listen to this. Pilate says, or he says to the Jews, Jesus is standing there. Behold your king. Six days later, they've been the accolades and the excitement. Behold our king comes. The prophecies have been fulfilled. Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna to the son of David. Now they're saying he's made himself out to be the son of David. That was their accusation against him. Then Pilate brings him out and stands him in front of the crowd and he says, Behold your king. Astonishing change. So they cried out, Away with him. Away with him. Crucify him. And Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, We have no king but Caesar. So he handed them over to them to be crucified. I mean, how can things turn around so quickly? I mean, I realize crowds can be a fickle thing. But I mean, how do you go from behold our king and say, Hosanna is he the son of David who comes in the name of the Lord, to crucify him when he's presented to them as their king just a few days later. Despite all the hype and the excitement surrounding the events about to transpire on to today, Palm Sunday, it would be short-lived. He was the Messiah, but not the one they were expecting. He's not the one they wanted. If you could say, he's not the one they ordered. They wanted a Messiah who would change their circumstances. Rome was the problem. And it was very, very apparent over these last four or five days that he was going to overturn Rome. He was not going to subdue Rome and deliver them from Roman oppression. But basically, they came to the point was, you defeat Rome and we will love you. You keep up the miracles and the free food and raising the dead and you keep doing the things we think you should do the way we think you should do them, and we will love you and we will follow you. But basically what they're saying, if you do all the things we want to, we, we will be the king and you will be our servant. You follow us and we will love you. But Jesus knew that their real problem was not Rome. It was sin. It was the rebellious hearts lodged deep within them of which they had no answer. They had no hope. They were not victims of Roman oppression but of rebellious hearts towards God. They were the enemies of God, dead in trespasses and sins. They were God, bro, breakers of God's law, God's commandments. 
They honored him with their lips, but their heart was far from him. They wanted a Messiah to free them from their bondage to Rome, not their bondage to sin. They wanted a deliverer, not a savior. They wanted a religious mascot, not a Messiah. They did not see themselves as lost, as under the condemnation of God, a heartbeat from hell. They did not see themselves in need of a savior. They did not see themselves as alienated from God, separated from God. But God did. That's how God saw them. That's how God sees you. That's how he sees me. And that's why Jesus came. The volume of this book, it says, is written about Jesus Christ. The Old Testament is written about a coming deliverer, a coming Messiah. The sacrifice is all pointed to one who would come and die, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world, as John called him. But they didn't want to change. They didn't see any need to change. It happens today. It happens all the time. The people love to get together. They love to sing in the church and sing praises. And it's not hard to work up the crowds with good music and good oratory skills and mass hysteria. And people sit in churches and they like to sing the hymns and the praise songs. They like being with friendly people. And this today and next weekend, there will be people who have never been in church since this time last year. And they will come and they will make journeys to Jerusalem and to Israel and walk down the, the path, the Via Della Rosa, where Jesus walked with his cross, and they'll go to the empty tomb. And there'll be millions and millions of people coming to church today who normally would not darken the door because it's Easter. People sit in churches and sing the hymns. They love the excitement. They'll sing, He Lives. They'll sing, Behold Our King. And they'll worship with the crowds. But their hearts are not with Him. His Word means nothing to them. His Word is not their authority. There are people sitting in churches, singing praises to God, who before the church service is over are saying, crucify him. We will not have this man rule over us. They're living in moral lifestyles. They come to church and they go home to li their live-in girlfriend, their live-in boyfriend. They're having, living in sexual impurity. They're living in unforgiveness, maybe to a friend, to a colleague. They have bitterness in their heart. They deny the reality of who Jesus says he was, the Son of God, the Emmanuel God with us. They do not believe that Jesus was God. They do not believe in his atoning death on the cross. But they sing about it. But they don't believe it. They sit and listen to messages week after week after week. And they sit... They sing songs week after week after week. Hosanna, which we said earlier, sang earlier. Hosanna in the highest. But they say on the way out the door, I'm not doing that. I don't care what that preacher said. I don't care what that pastor said. I don't care what the Bible says. God is not going to rule over my life. I don't agree with this. I don't agree with that. God's word is not the authority of my life. One day Jesus is going to look at these people and he's going to say, why do you say that I am king? Why do you call me Lord, Lord, but don't do what I say? That's treason. How can you say you're a child of the king, but you won't obey the king? That's what R.C. Sproul, that's what sin is. It's what R.C. Sproul calls cosmic treason. They come and they sit and they praise. And before they're out the door on Monday morning, they say, crucify him. He's not ruling over me. He's not ruling over me. 
I'm going to live my life the way I want to live it. I'm going to do what I want to do morally. And nobody's going to tell me what to do. Behold your king. And you say crucify him. He's really your enemy. And you don't want the king to be your enemy. He's your judge. You don't want the judge to be your enemy. One day we are going to stand before the king of kings as our, and he's going to judge us and he's going to deal with us. And Jesus will look at those people who have rejected him and said, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do the things that I tell you to do? Depart from me. I never knew you. Depart from me. I never knew you. I want you to tag, tack along with me, if you will, for a few minutes. Thinking about, behold, your king. Is he your king? He is your king. I don't care who you are. I don't care where your name runs. I don't care where you're from. He is the king of kings and the lord of lords. He created you. You belong to him. And you either are a He's either your king, he's your king, and you're either a rebel in his kingdom, or you're redeemed by the king in his kingdom. You have been bought back through the blood of Jesus Christ. But he is your king. You can, you'll never escape that. You'll never escape the fact that Christ is king. He's the king of kings and the Lord of lords, and you're either a rebel in his kingdom, or you've been rescued. By the king, from your sin, through his death on the cross. To follow along with me, for, if you will, I'd just like to read some scriptures that I think illustrate this, behold your king. Acts 2, 32 to 33, Peter's message at Pentecost, I won't read the whole sermon, but verse 32 says, This Jesus God raised up. And of that we are all witnesses, being therefore exalted at the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out on this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. What's Peter telling them? To, there? He says, Behold your king. Jesus, God raised him up. And he is exalted at the right hand of God. He is with God. He is the king of kings. Behold your king. That great book of Revelation begins with these words, To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom, priests to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Behold, he's coming with the clouds and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all the tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Even so, amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was. And who is to come. Revelation begins what? Behold your king. In Revelation 19, the judgments are over. God's wrath has been poured out on this world. And those who have rejected God's rule in their lives, they've rejected salvation through his son, Jesus Christ. It's reaching its climax. And in verses 6, it says, Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters, like the sound of mighty peals of thunder crying out, Hallelujah! For the Lord our God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give Him glory. For the marriage of the Lamb has come and His bride has made herself ready. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure. For the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And then I saw heaven open and behold a white horse. And one sitting on it is called faithful and true, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems, and he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and the name by which he is called, the Word of God. And the armies of heaven, arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. And from his mouth comes a sharp sword, which with which to strike down the nations. And he will rule them with a rod of iron, and he will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of Kings 
and Lord of Lords. Revelation begins, behold the king. And Revelation ends, behold the king. Jesus Christ is the one true everlasting king. He is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. Peter concludes his sermon in Acts chapter 2. Let all the house of Israel know, therefore, know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. And now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. And Peter and the rest of the disciples said to the Peter and the rest of the disciples, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter says, repent, repent, and turn back that your sins may be blotted out. Turn back, repent, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. What a contrast we see in John's gospel in the first chapter. He was in the world and the world was made through him and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and those who were his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them gave he the, the right to become the children of God, even to those who believe on his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelled among us, and we saw his glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. Behold your king. Have you been saved from your sin? Have you been saved from your rebellion against the king of kings and the lord of lords? Not by works, but have you been saved by God's grace through faith alone in what Christ did for you on the cross? Christ hung on the cross for your sin and for my sin. The Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. He took the handwriting of ordinances out of the way that it was against us and nailed it to the cross. Jesus died for our rebellion against him. He is your king. A few years ago, I remember, don't want to get on politics, but when Trump got elected after the first election, when he was elected there, five years ago now. Remember what people were saying? He may be the president, but he's not my president. Well, that's what they think. He was their president, whether they liked him or not. And you say, he may be, hold, he may be the king, but he's not my king, and you're wrong. He's your king. The question is, the only question is, are you rebellion against him? If you are, one day you're going to face the consequences of that rebellion. You're going to stand before God and he's going to say, depart from me, I never knew you. He's going to cast you into eternal hell with all the other rebels of his kingdom. A place prepared for Satan and his angels who rebelled against him in heaven and were cast out. He is your king. Behold your king, J.C. Riley says these words, Behold your king riding on a donkey, dying on the cross for sin. Behold your king rising from the dead, victorious and coming again to rule and to reign. There's going to be an awful lot of tongue wagging and fist shaking in Revelation. We've been studying that in our men's Bible study. And God's coming back and he's going to punish this world and judge this world for their rebellion against Christ, against his rightful rule over their lives. And they're going to be wagging their t tongues and shaking their fists and, and utter rebellion till the very end. But they are going to lose and Christ is going to reign. He's going to rule and reign. And his reign is going to last forever. J.C. Riley has put it this way, You cannot trifle forever. A time will come when you must be serious, and that time is today. 
You cannot put off your soul's concerns forever. A day will come when you must have a reckoning with God. You will. We all must stand before the judgment seat of Christ. The great white throne. He says, you cannot always be singing and dancing and eating and drinking and dressing and reading and laughing and jesting and scheming and planning and money making. I beseech you by the mercies of God to look this question fairly in the face. I entreat you not to, st to stifle conscience by vague hopes of God's mercy while your heart cleaves to the world. He says, I implore you not to drown convictions by childish fancies about God's love while your daily ways and habits show plainly that the love of the Father is not in you. There is mercy in God like a river, but it is for the penitent believer in Christ Jesus. There is a love in God towards sinners which is unspeakable and unsearchable, but it is for those who hear Christ's voice and follow him and obey him. Cast yourself wholly and unreservedly on the Lord Jesus for time and eternity. And then he concludes with this, O oh, better a million times be laughed at and thought extreme in this world than to go down to hell from the midst of the congregation. End quote. One day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Jesus says, come unto me all you who labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. That's the invitation of the King. One day you will behold your King. It could be today. Are you ready? Will you meet him as a rebel in his kingdom or a redeemed child of God? Our only hope is to behold him clothed, is to be clothed in the right, perfect righteousness of Jesus Christ, imputed to us through faith in him. All our sin was imputed to Christ and his righteousness, perfect righteousness imputed to us. And we now stand before God the King of kings, clothed in the perfect righteousness of his Son, Jesus Christ. Behold your King. Who are you in the story? Who are you in the story? All the hoopla, what the crowds say, maybe what you were saying, what the crowds are singing, maybe what you were singing. But what are you saying on the way out the door? What are you going to be saying tomorrow to your friends? What's this, your lifestyle going to be saying? I love him, but I long to obey him because he is the king. Or are you saying, we will not have this man rule over us? I don't care what the Bible says. I don't care what the pastor says. I don't care what my friends say, my believing friends. He's not ruling over me. I pray if that's you, you might bow your knee before it's too late. That the Holy Spirit would convict you of sin, of judgment, and of righteousness. And you would fall down now and bow your knee to Jesus Christ and say, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. And you know what? He will. He will show you mercy, compassion, forgiveness, and wipe your, your sins clean. And you will be as white as snow. Don't turn away. We cannot always strive and be just trifling with sin. We gotta, today is the day of salvation. Today, do not harden your heart, but come to Christ before it's too late. Father, we just pray that you'll just open the hearts of those watching this this morning to, to realize the gravity and the seriousness of what we're talking about. Behold the king, your king. Am I a rebel in God's kingdom? We know where God, we belong to God. If we know we love him if we keep his commandments. That's what subjects do in a kingdom. They obey the king. 
And for all those who disobey him, there will come a day of reckoning. And it'll be too late then to change your mind. It'll be too late. You'll bow your knee, but it will not change where you're headed. We bow our knee in this life to Jesus Christ. And acknowledge him for who he is and what he's done for us on the cross. Lord, I pray that if there's some watching this who've said, Lord, I've never been, they've never been forgiven. They've never been changed. Their heart has never been changed. They like the crowds. They like the songs. They like getting caught up in the emotion of the services. But that's all it is. Before they're out the door, Monday morning when they go to work, when they go home, it's all irrelevant. He's not ruling over me. I pray, Lord, that you might just convict them of their sin, of their need of a Savior, and that you might show them Jesus Christ and his beauty and his glory and what he did for them on the cross. He became an atonement for them. He died in their place. He bore the wrath of God for them, for all those who will believe in him. And so, Father, we just pray that you might just do what only you can do. Draw them, open their eyes and their heart to the truth. Draw them to yourself that they might know this King, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, that they might recognize their sinfulness and find in Jesus a great and glorious Savior from sin. So bless us today as we celebrate, as we move towards Easter, once as we're reminded of the realities of Easter, and that every day of our life is a celebration of the resurrection of Christ. And so I pray you might do a mighty work in the hearts of your people until we give the glory. In Jesus' name, amen.